Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. Okay, first of all, let me just say there's, as we looked at our outline here in the book of Philippians, the whole key to the book of Philippians is rejoicing in joy. God wants us to have joy. And obviously, there are a lot of things involved in this world that will rob us of our joy. And we can become very bitter and we can become very sour when it comes to being a Christian. We can always be looking for fault. We can always be looking behind us. We can always be looking at problems. And there's a lot of problems. And so it becomes a major problem for us that robs us of joy. The four joy robbers that we've talked about, again, we'll start with the, the joy robber of circumstances in chapter 1. We looked at that to begin with. Paul was in prison. <clears throat> the circumstances were definitely against him being joyful, but he was rejoicing because God had given him a purpose in his imprisonment. Chapter 2 is about people, the joy robber's people, but he says, look not every man at his own things, but look on the things of others. Other people are more important. We need to understand that people are our reason for being here. We're not here for Christ. If we were here only for Christ, he could bring us to heaven. We could glorify, we could praise him in heaven. But the one thing we won't have in heaven is the ability to help people. We won't have the ability to lead people to Christ. We won't have the ability to teach, teach or disciple them. They will all know of him at that day. Chapter 3 is about things. The things that were gained for Paul, he counted loss for Christ. And obviously there are many problems when it comes to people. There are many problems that come to things that rob us of joy. When the Apostle Paul said, this one thing I do, it give, gives you the idea here, of course, that when you talk about things, there's many things, there's many people. Every person has a thought. Every person has a will. Every person has an opinion. If you're going to follow people, if your job in life is to see people and to try to imitate or mimic them, because there are so many people with so many ideas, so many opinions, you will be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. The Bible is one. It's a unity. Jesus Christ is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And so what we need to do is follow one person, one Christ, one Lord, one faith, so that we won't be tossed to and fro by different doctrines. Obviously, one of the problems that we have in church today is there's a lot of people who follow people, who follow leaders, who follow teachers, who do not necessarily have the same opinion as one another, and so they're tossed to and fro. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him, which is the head, even Christ. God wants us to grow up. He wants us to follow him individually, um, solely, and get our strength, our knowledge, our emotion, our will from him. You can see intellect, emotion, and will in this last verse. The truth, intellect, love, that's emotion. But speaking is doing the truth and love. That's our will. Our will comes in in conformity with what we know and with what we, we, we feel, what we, we believe. And it leads to our obedience or speaking. So you can see the person involved here coming to maturity intellectually, emotionally, in his will, to the head, which is Jesus Christ. If we follow people, we will be tossed, but we need to speak the truth in love because the key to joy, the key to joy is going to be purpose. The key to overcoming things, because there are so many things, is purpose. Purpose is definite, it's defined, it's one path, it's one thing, it's one thought, it's one goal. And the Apostle Paul is giving us one person to follow, one person to look at, and that's the key to having joy in your life. Now again, we said last week by way of introduction, one thing I've I desire to the Lord that I may seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple. That sounds like three things. But the author, the psalmist, says one thing. This is one thing I'm talking about. All of these things, dwelling in the house of the Lord, 
beholding his beauty, inquiring in his temple, that's all about one thing. It's about the Lord. It's about drawing close to him. It's understanding who he is. It's understanding that he is my purpose. He's the finisher of my faith. Blessed is the man whom you choose. I'll tell you what an incredible verse. The Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. Many people are called. There are, God sends a calling upon the life of every believer in Christ has a call to his life. But not every believer is chosen for service because it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. He has to be willing to run in the race. He has to be willing to become part of the race, not just a spectator, not to look on, but to get involved and to begin to run. You understand, when we talk about Hebrews chapter 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, Jesus is the author. The word means leader, the ruler. He's the leader of our faith. Now you can picture looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame. What we're talking about in that passage, running the race that's set before us, he is setting the pace. He is ahead of us. He's setting the pace. And, and obviously what we're trying to do is just to follow him, to keep our eyes on him and keep our pace with what he is setting in front of us. If we do set him as our leader and we follow him and he sets the pace, we'll never be him. We will never be perfect like he is perfect. But God wants us to be brought to a maturity level that our eyes are solely upon him, that he is the one person we need and that will lead us to the finish line. It will lead us to the completion that we're looking at. Blessed is the man whom you choose. And as I said, one of the greatest blessings there is is God chose you to run in this race. He individually chose you and he says, would you run? Would you run for my, my pleasure? Would you be involved in this race for my pleasure? But Lord, their race is a lot shorter than my race. Lord, I have to run uphill both ways. I have to run uphill to school and I have to run uphill to home. Now that makes no sense, as you know. But obviously, we look at that and God says, just keep with the race. He's chosen you to run. To seek him in his house, we mentioned that last week. Blessed are they that dwell in your house. They will be still praising thee, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Blessed is the man whom you choose and cause to approach, that he may dwell in thy courts. He, we shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house even of thy holy temple. Now, once again, it sounds like three things, four things. <laughs> we lo want to love this house. We want to love his building. It's not four things. This building is the body of Jesus Christ. When you do it unto the least of these lives, brethren, you have done it unto him. Where two or three are gathered in his name, there he's in the midst. So loving his house, loving his building, loving his church is about loving him. And people who do not want to go to church, who reject church, are rejecting him. They're not rejecting church. Because the church is his body. That's where he is. He has required us, commanded us, not forsake the assembling of yourself together as a man or some is. And people think they can separate the two. You can't do that. This is his body. This is his church. You can't really get close to Christ without getting close to his body. That's him. That's who he is. It's not two different things. To purpose to seek his face. When you said, seek my face, my heart said, thy face will I seek. Now, what I'm, what I'm interested in this as part of our purpose is your heart says to you, seek his face. <laughs> but what happens is your intellect says this is what you should do. Your heart says, and then your will comes into conformity. And my heart says, I will seek your face. I've seen it in your word. I've understood it. My heart has told me to do this. And then my will has come in con conformity to that. And so therefore I obey and do that. And I seek his face. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteous. And all these things will be added unto you. These are just introductory remarks again from last week. I was just going to complete some of this last week. Obviously I'm not preaching a whole sermon on it. But I want you to understand this that 
All these things. What things? Well, the things in the passage are talking about your food, your clothing, your raiment, your, uh, your, that where you live, that all these things will be added unto you. Now, what he says, if you seek God and his kingdom, then the things, the food, the clothing, the shelter, that's going to be added to you if you seek him. If you seek the one, you'll get both of them. You'll get the food, clothing, and, and shelter, but you'll also get his presence, his righteousness, if you seek him first. Now, please understand, you've got these things that you're seeking. What is the key? It's the order of which you seek them. God wants you to seek first the kingdom of God, and these things will be added unto you. He does not say to you to seek this first, and this will be added unto you. God has made it very clear that if you want these, if you want both of them, if you want God and his righteousness, and you want food, clothing, and shelter, there's a priority here, and this has to be sought first. If you seek this first, then these things will be added to you. Added to what? Added to the righteousness and God's kingdom. That will be added. But you'll have that first, and the other things will be added. Now again, as, my, as I've shared with you many times, it's one of the dilemmas that Christians face. They want their kids, they want their kids to have this stuff, and so they really push them to seek this stuff. They want them to have it, so they push them to seek it. And they think they're doing their kids a great favor by seeking it, but they miss the priority. They miss the thing that is first and foremost. Becomes a big problem for them. Again, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable. Why would anyone want to be conformable to his death? Why would you want to be conformable to his death that I might attain to the resurrection of the dead? That's the point, isn't it? If we want the power of the resurrection, we have to understand the fellowship of the sufferings. If we have the conformation to his death, then we also have the attaining to the resurrection of the dead. And so this is what we want. We want the power of the resurrection, but it only comes when we have the fellowship of his sufferings. So when we're on this run, when we are on this race, and we're running uphill both directions, very difficult at times to do this. As you know, God seems to continually stretch you. He seems to always be testing you in one more thing, and you get to, to feel at some point that this becomes overwhelming. Have any of you felt that way recently? I'll tell you what, I, this last month has been overwhelming for me. <clears throat> and you can understand how that goes when you have the, their fair booth. I'm working on my house, I have the fair booth. <coughs> Don't have really time to get messages prepared. Then we've got to go into getting Gilgal ready. And then we have Gilgal five days. You have no time for messages during Gilgal. And you're with the kids nine to three and on Friday nine to four having a great time, but you're being stretched. And why does he do that? Why does he push you and push you to stretch your faith? And I'm telling you, one of the main reasons for those things is to show you that you need to continue to perfection. You're not mature yet. You have areas that need to develop yet in your life. You do not have control of all of your intellect, emotion, and will yet. That your intellect, emotion, and will has to be brought in conformity to him. You need to get more power from him. And his power is available as we seek his face. Now obviously, every one of us have to go through those times when we feel the fellowship of his sufferings. When we feel that there's more to do than we have the capability of doing. Okay, here's where we start then. <laughs> We are going to start and hit the first point. Purpose is perfection. I want you to understand this. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect. God wants us to continue on to a maturity. Therefore... You understand that we have a tremendous desire to be Christians, to call ourselves Christians, to accept Jesus Christ as Savior. And I think just about everybody in this room has accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And as I said to you before, that's not the end of this church. That's the beginning of this church. That's the beginning of your walk with Christ. That's the beginning of life. 
When you lead a person to Christ, you have responsibility to that person. This church is all about what happens after a person comes to know Christ as Savior. Its goal is not simply to lead people to Christ. Our goal as a church is to present every man perfect or mature before Christ. Which means if we had 10 people accept Christ last week, six in Gilgal and four in the jail ministry, that is an awesome responsibility that God has given to me. I have to somehow find a way to disciple people. And that's not easy. Do you understand where problem is? That's the church where the church comes in. <coughs> we have a problem in our country today. Let me explain this. We have women who abort their babies. They have a child growing inside of them. They have conceived life in their, in their womb. And they say, I do not want that responsibility at this time. I can't afford it. I can't take care of this one. I want to get rid of that responsibility. I want to kill that baby. I want to abort it. So I can go on with my life without that responsibility. And we call this a holocaust. Because we're having all these women who do not understand that when they conceive life, God gives them responsibility to raise that life. To care for that life. When you plant the seed, God gives you the responsibility to nurture and nourish that seed till it grows and bears fruit. But there's also another holocaust that you and I understand that has been taking place in churches across America because we have someone come to know Christ as Savior and then we ignore them and we do not disciple them, we do not nurture them, we do not nourish them and they grow up stunted and in their growth and they do not glorify God they do not bear fruit and they're a hindrance to the gospel of Christ they're a hindrance to the testimony of Jesus Christ and they have at some point put their trust in Christ and God begins to deal with them but please understand we have forsaken the responsibility that God gave to us as a church when someone comes to know Christ the Savior, it is our responsibility to nurture and nourish that one. Otherwise, we have a second holocaust. We have the responsibility to bring that one up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and bring them to maturity. Our goal as a church is to present every man saved in Christ. No, it's not. That's not our goal. It's not our goal to lead everyone in Rochester to Christ. Our goal as a church, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. We've got to teach what we know to them and help them to be able to understand that so they can teach it to someone else. That's what our Sunday school classes are about. That's what our preaching is about. That's what Foundations class is about. And I'm grateful because the prison ministry, I have Tim, Tom, and Craig that go down there and they will be working with those ones that they can work with, that the Lord gives them, and they will be working at nurturing and nourishing them and, and helping to disciple them. Now that is our responsibility. And again, we have a full church full of people. And are they all perfect yet? No. Am I perfect yet? No. I want you to understand the word for, for maturity or for perfection here in this passage is teleos. It's the same word that Jesus Christ used on the cross when he said tetelaos or tetelestai which means it is finished or it is, it is completed. And what the idea here is not that we ever get sinlessly perfect. It is not saying that we get to live like the righteousness of God. That's not what it's saying. We receive the righteousness of God, but we're still sinful. We never become sinlessly perfect, never. But we do grow and we do become more and more mature where we can start following the Lord Jesus Christ on our own and looking to him and running our race and God can call us 
and we are some of those ones that are blessed by God because we're called. Perfect. God wants us to be perfect. Again, let us therefore as many as be completed or matured be thus minded. But look into this, this, into this promise. I've shared with many of you over the years that this is one of my favorite verses in the New Testament. Of course, Philip, 1 Peter 5.10 is my favorite verse in the New Testament, but this is like number two. I love this promise. I, I, I use this promise in my own life all the time. 1 Peter 3.15 or Philippians 3.15, let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this unto you. If there is something in your life and you know something in your life that's lacking, something that's wrong, and again, that goes with those tests that you go through that where he stretches you, and, and you realize, man, what's in my heart right now is yuck. I can't stand the way I feel right now. I don't like what's, what I'm thinking right now. I don't like the weakness of my will right now. And God begins to reveal that to you. And you begin to see, you know what? I need some work in this area. I need to be praying and asking God to strengthen me in this area. I need to have a stronger emotion. Listen, we just, we just thought about that one verse in, in Ephesians 4.14. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things. That's one of the things that's really, really lacking in the church. I, not this church so much. I'm not, not complaining about this church. We've got some incredible people here. But love is really lacking in churches today. Love is really lacking. There are people who are willing to speak the truth, but they're really lacking in love. And obviously, what we are looking at is we have to have maturity in the whole, whole person not just in knowledge, but in the whole person has to be mature. Not just, let me, let me, I'll get to that in just a minute. Philippians 3.14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I press toward the mark for the prize. The word prize in this verse is interesting because it's the word scopus. I think I have mentioned the word scopus to you in the past. You've heard telescope or microscope. The word scopus in the Greek means watching. I mentioned to you before that in Israel there's a number of different mountains, Mount Zion, there's Mount of Olives, but there's one hill, it's called Mount Scopus, it's called the Mount of Watching. That's where the watchtower would have been, it would have been watching over the north, where, where the enemy would be coming from in, in Jerusalem, Mount Scopus, the Mount of Watching. But you can imagine what he's saying, I press toward the mark for the, for the watching of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What in the world, watching? Well, you think, oh no, no, he's running to get a prize. Okay, he's running to get a prize. The prize, I, one, of my, one of the girls at Gilgal made this this past week, and this is, is somewhat similar to that, you know? You know, this is somewhat similar to that, what we're looking at there. This is probably poisonous. <laughs> I don't know what it is. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. Anyway, but anyway, I press toward the prize of the, of, the, of the watching. Obviously, this is not much of a prize to run for. They did not get gold medals. They did not get, get an endorsement for Nike where they could make millions of dollars wearing Nike tennis shoes. They did not get that. Their prize was an olive wreath. How much is that worth, an olive wreath? How long is it going to last, an olive wreath? It doesn't have a lot of value, that olive wreath. That's not what they were racing for. And Paul uses this word, I press toward the scopus, the watching of the high calling. What is the reward? The high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I am racing because at the finish line, there are people that are going to be watching me. There are people at the finish line that are watching me run. And I want to please them because the faster I run, the better I do, the more pleasure I will bring those that are watching. Make sense? You can imagine if you have the Caesar of all Rome there watching and applauding you as you come into the stadium and they start standing up and clapping for you because you are running a race to win to be victorious in this race. Now I want you to picture what this is like. 
Let's just say that your father has terminal cancer and your father, the one last thing he wants to do in his life is he wants you to run this, watch you run this race. And so they wheel him to the finish line and he is there and he's shaking and he's in anticipation. Now you go back to the starting line and your dad is there at the finish line. He wants to watch you run this race. What are you going to be thinking of during that race? What are you going to be thinking of? Obviously, if you do very poor in this race and you have a terrible race, you're going to think about that the rest of your life. That this is the last thing my dad watched me do. And so you're thinking the whole time, what is my lap time? It was better than you've ever done before. I'm looking at a personal best and I'm running as hard as I can because there's someone at the finish line who's watching me. Someone that I want to please. It is a high calling in my life. I want to please this one at the finish line. And so I come in and let's say I do the, a personal best or even I win this race. And they give me $5,000 for winning this race. What do you think will mean more to me, the $5,000 or the fact that my dad saw me? What would you think? You understand, if this is the last race he's going to see me run, the 5,000 is not that important to me. The prize scope is who's at the end watching. I flee to the watching of the reward. I flee, I press on, or I flee to the watching of the reward. Paul is not asking us to run for the prize. He's asking us to run for our pleasure. And the pleasure is the one who chose you to run in this race. Blessed is the one whom the Lord has chosen. He's chosen you to run. What pleases God? It doesn't look like I'm going to finish this lesson either. <laughs> what pleases God? Well, first thing that Bible is very clear about is faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Therefore, it is possible to please him by faith. Faith must please him. Wouldn't you agree? And now therefore, if we're running this race to please him at the end, we're watching, we're running for the watching, the scopus, for the prize. We're running for the scopus. We're running for the watching. Then we want to have faith. We want to run this race with faith because we know that is something that pleases him when we're running by faith. What pleases God? Well, love, we believe love pleases God. We believe that there's faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love, that love pleases God. By this shall all men know you're my disciples if you have love one to another. This is my commandment that you love one another. We believe that love pleases God and God says to his son, about his son, this is my beloved, my loved son in whom I am well pleased. This is my loved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. The greatest of these, I believe, is love. It's one of the things that that God is pleased with his beloved son. We believe that God is pleased with obedience. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord, which means that God has great delight when we obey the voice of the Lord. He does not have as much great delight in burnt offerings, but he does have great delight in obeying the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. So we see in the Bible, at least there's a number of things that please him, but we know faith pleases him, love pleases him, obedience pleases him. Now, please again, as I said to you before, the whole person is involved here because faith has an awful lot to do with the substance, the evidence of things seen, the evidence of things hoped for. It has a lot to do with our, our, our mind. Faith has an awful lot to do with what we know. Love has an awful lot to do with what we feel, our emotion, and obedience has an awful lot to do with our, our will. And so God wants us to love him with our, our emotion, with our will, with our intellect. He wants our whole being and he says, again, and, and I'll, I'll share this with you again later, but he says, uh, what is the great, first and greatest command? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and all your might. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. There are three different things there and I think you can see the whole being there. Your heart, your emotion, your soul, your intellect, your might, your, 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 your will, your desire. 
which means that God expects us to not only obey him, but to obey him in our intellect, emotion, and will. There are the Pharisees did obey him. They paid tithes of mint and dill and cumin, but they neglected the weightier matters of law, justice and mercies and faith. But he doesn't say they were doing wrong in their obedience. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You ought to have done this, but you shouldn't have ne neglected the others. It was right for them to have done this, to pay their tithes. That was obedience. But they did not obey him in love. So it was all an outward thing. It was not from their heart. It was not with their mind. It was just something outwardly. There are people who love, say they love him, but they don't obey him. But you really can't love God because the Bible says love is the fulfillment of the law. Right? So if you're going to love God, you're going to fulfill the law. So you're going to have obedience if you're going to have love. But there's people who have Lots and lots of knowledge, but they don't have a heart. They have people that have a will, but they don't have enough intellect. Zeal without knowledge. They have a desire, but they don't have the knowledge that goes along with that desire. So God wants us to, and thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. God wants us to have our entire being present when we obey and worship and honor him. The word press and strong means to run swiftly, to catch a person or a thing, in this case to catch a thing, the prize, the upward calling that God has. God has a high calling. Let me just finish, I'll just finish with this slide, please. I just want to once again remind you that there's a race that God has chosen you to run. Right? The race that God has chosen you to run, it is not the same race as your spouse, not necessarily. It's not the same race as your brother. It's not the same race as your mom or dad. Your race is different. Everybody has a different race. And you might say, hey, I, I'm better at the sprint. But for most people, their life is not a sprint. Their life is a marathon. And God expects us in that life to keep on keeping on and keep on in this race. And remember he says, forgetting those things which are behind. You're not looking back. You're not living your life the way you did it 20 years ago. You're not looking back. You know, when I was in basketball years ago, we would run red lines a lot. And you'd run, now in those days, they would have you run, and then you'd run backwards to the, to the back, and then you'd run forward, and then you'd keep running red lines backward and forward. They don't do that anymore because too many kids tripped and hit their head on the, the gym floor. Very, very hurtful. So they didn't do that anymore. But, but you used to run forward and backward like that when you did red lines. But that's the way a lot of people are. They get running in their Christian life, and they say, boy, but remember what it was like. Remember what it was like. And so they start running back in their memories of what it was like. I wish we could go back to that time. And then they start running forward again. And went, well, but I remember what it was like over here. And, and so their, bi their, their bodies are constantly changing directions because they're going to what it, they used to do. They're going what they used to love. They keep going back to the world. They go back to Christ. They go back to the world. They go back to Christ. And it's like they're running red lines, you know. And the Bible says you've got to forget about that. <laughs> You've got to forget about God's blessings are not on you today because of what you did yesterday. It's not like you can live your whole life based upon God's blessings of what you did 10 years ago. You've got a race to run and there's a forward path and there's an end in view and you're running to the end. You're running to the finisher, the one who's going to pronounce your race as being done. And he's going to, going to say, we pray, we hope, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Enter into the joy of thy Lord.
As I said in the beginning of this, this is the key, isn't it? It's a key of where you find joy in the book of Philippians chapter 3. Where you're going to find joy in the book of Philippians chapter 3 is going to be purpose. It's going to be having a single purpose, a single heart, a single mind, a single will. That I'm going to obey with my intellect, emotion, and will, my Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to run this race. And it's going to be hard sometimes to keep going. It's going to be hard sometimes. I will want to quit. But God just says, keep looking, looking, looking to the future, to the goal. Let's close in prayer. Perhaps there's someone here who has not accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. You're not certain you're saved. Please understand that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He is the Son of God. He is our Savior. He died for you on the cross, and you cannot work your way to heaven. There's only one way to get to heaven. is through the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son. He's a propitiation for your sins, not for your sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Unto us born this day in the city of David a Savior. He is our Savior. He saves us of sin. Church is not the Savior. Baptism is not the Savior. If you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, you need to do that. You need to accept him. But that's just the starting point. Then you need to grow. Then you need to grow. I want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask him that he might be your savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.